Okay, who has used PG Bonzo before? No? <laughs> okay, it's about a third, okay. So, uh, quick intro. PG Bouncer, I, uh, PG Bouncer calls itself a, a, a connection pooling demon, but I like to think of it as a Postgres protocol proxy. Basically, you have a, a database client, normal Postgres database application, which would normally connect to a Postgres database, and instead you can stick a proxy in between. And the concept of proxying is well known in other protocols. HTTP proxies are very popular, and they have all kinds of functionalities, and other protocols have proxies as well. And this is just the same, right? It reads the protocol, looks at a couple things, and may or may not do things with it, and then it forwards the uh, data to the regular database, and also on the way back. So that's what PG Bonzo does. And there's Alternatives uh, such as PG Pool, which I'll talk briefly later, um, that essentially do the same thing. Just brief sort of detail so you can understand a couple of the later uh, details I'm going to go into. PG Bounce is uh, just started as a command. You give it a configuration file, which is often at that location, but it doesn't have to be. You can put it wherever you want. I find it useful when I log into a box, I look at the process list, I can actually see what the configuration file is, because otherwise that could be confusing. And it has a, the, the configuration file has this .ini format, which is mainly known from Windows, so it has like these bracketed sections, and in the PG Bouncer configuration, the main section is the database section and the uh, PG Bouncer section. Database section determines where your downstream connection is going. So in this case, if I connect to the proxy as, and say I want to connect to database foo, then what PG Bouncer does is like, aha, uh -huh, I'm actually going to send this information to this place. And this is a Postgres connection string. Right? And if you connect to this database, then it goes there. And if you connect to a database that's not listed here, it gives you an error message that the data database doesn't exist. And there are a lot of details to this, but that's the basic functionality. And then down here in the PG Bouncer section, you give a general configuration information. Most important one, perhaps, is you give it, have to give it a port number. And as you know, Postgres uses 5432 as its standard port. PG Bouncer, I've seen in practice all kinds of port numbers being used. The default, in, in the sense that the, uh, the source code is, or the, the template configuration file uses that port, is 6432. Uh, but there's no reason why you'd have to use that. You could also, you know, cheat and use 5432, I guess, if you want, and then have the actual Postgres server use a different port. That might be a good idea or not. So that, that's uh, just a super quick intro to PG Monster. Um, so let's talk about connection pooling, which is the, uh, the most well-known functionality, but as I will argue later, maybe not the most useful one. So this is a um, you know, client server with a database application, a database server. Now what, what happened in, in, in the really old days is that the uh, you know, typical example was a, a PHP application which was a, a con composed of a bunch of pages. And because the, the page only lived as long as the page was executing, then everything was removed. Every time you loaded a new page, it had to open all its resources again, right? And it had to open all the database connections again, which is very slow. And uh, then, well, some smart people said, well, let's just have a connection pooling thing in between. And admittedly, PG Monster was not the first one to come up with that. PG Pool was the first to do that. But you would basically po possibly run it on the same host even, so in the, in the same box here, and then the application would connect to the, the proxy, which is quite, quite cheap and quick. And then the proxy would keep connections open to the backend database, which, is, uh, which are slow to open, but it just holds on to them. Nowadays, you could say, well, why don't you just keep your connections open? Don't close them all the time. And that's probably <laughs> a good idea, right? But there's still reasons to do this, just in terms of how you design your applications in terms of resiliency, especially if, if your applications are complicated. 
and you have multiple threads and all kinds of things, it's very, it's kind of can keep, can be very difficult to to keep one connection open all the time and be able to use it everywhere else. So sometimes it's actually quite useful. You just throw the connection away when you don't don't need it anymore, and and because you know opening another one is cheap. So it, this is still kind of useful, but maybe the main use case from you know in the 90s is what I'm thinking of is is maybe is going away. So. Let's look at some uh, measurements, and uh, the resolution on this is a little bit low, but I'll uh, read it back. So I was interested in, in how much overhead does this present. So I wrote a couple of quick test programs, which are, I, I will supply with the, with the slides, but they're very simple C programs. The first one is just open a connection, just check, make an error check that you actually opened the connection, and then disconnect. Do that 10,000 times. If you connect directly to Postgres, so 10,000 connection open and close basically. Directly to Postgres, 24 seconds. Connect to PG Bouncer, four seconds, point something. So that basically shows why, why that is useful. What I did a couple uh, months ago now, is I wrote my own clone of PG Bouncer in, in Python, just as an experiment. It's highly recommended if you also want to practice in programming. Um, written in Python, totally unoptimized, doesn't have any smarts about it. Just you know, accepts connections, puts them into a list, does some locking, and then forwards the packets through. So connecting to that 10,000 times, 10 seconds, compared to 24 to Postgres. So even you know, you can see how what the how a slow connecting Postgres really is. Even if you use like a totally dumb proxy implementation, you can totally beat out connecting directly to Postgres. So that's uh, that's the rationale for connection pooling. So second test was um, connecting and then running a query, which in this case is just select one and then disconnecting. So at least you're doing some work in the back end, right? Uh, so directly to Postgres, 10,000 times is 27 seconds. To Postgres, uh, to PG Bouncer, almost seven seconds. And uh, my own proxy clone, um, almost 13 seconds. So you can see the overhead of actually running the square is the same. The connection overhead is really significant in this case. Obviously, we're not doing a whole lot of work. Once you do more work, the, the overhead goes, goes away a little bit. And, and finally, um, this is just keeping a, one connection open and then doing 100,000, in this case, not 10,000, 100,000 uh, queries and then disconnecting. And there you can see there is some overhead to, uh, to having a proxy in between, right? So if you just keep a connection open directly to Postgres, it's almost seven seconds via PG Bouncer, it's 11 seconds. So there's quite a bit of overhead. Obviously, the work here is cheap, just select one. So once that overhead gets more significant, that difference goes away a little bit. But there's some overhead, right? In my own stupid implementation, 21 seconds. And with PG Pool, uh, 12 seconds. So it's slightly slower than uh, PG Bouncer. The reason I have PG Pool here and not on the previous slides is that I, that those previous two tests actually crashed PG Pool. So <laughs> it's. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, what was that a question? Uh, so, the whatever was, uh, yeah, whatever was packaged the most recent. I, I ha had a version of this talk uh, a couple months ago in um, uh, Philadelphia uh, Postgres user group where I did these measurements and I, I actually PG pool functioned, but I made a mistake was pointed out to me afterwards because I, originally I ran these tests with uh, database, PG database equals Postgres. And then PG pool came out really badly. It was really slow. And somebody told me later that if you connect to the Postgres database, PG pool doesn't do any pooling. So it has somehow has this special case. So that's kind of weird. And so in this case, I had to actually make sure I used like some other non-default database. And some, in that case, PG pool actually did its pooling, but didn't do so well. So. If you know, if someone actually is, is a, an expert about PG Pool, I would gladly demonstrate that and debug that with someone uh, later or online. So now the real, so that was a, the sort of default use case of connection pooling. More interestingly uh, to me 
is uh, connection queuing. And that's a term I made up, so that's not a standard term. Um, I work at uh, meetme.com, which is a social network um, site, and so we are basically a website exposed to the internet, right? We get all, and there's a, you know, some web clients going on, and they are basically exposed to the open internet, and so we have, you know, the number of connections that could be com coming in here is, you know, unbounded by whatever happens out there in the world, right? But we have learned quickly, and this has become quite important to us uh, uh, in the database administration team, is that it's very important to restrict the number of connections that the Postgres server takes on. And there are you know, ways to configure that inside of Postgres, you know, max connections, and you can have connections limits per user and that kind of thing. But once those are exhausted, then what happens to your clients? They, they will just then error out, right? And that's not good for them. So what uh, PG Bouncer can do and, and does by default is you, you tell it how many connections you want to pass through and everyone else has to wait. So you, you know, default setting is 20. You know, that depends on obviously how, mainly how you know, big your database server hardware is. You could do that proportional to the number of uh, CPU cores possibly, or what, you know, depending on what, what workload you have. But you want to have it you know, less than 100 or 200, something like that, right? Certainly not 1,000. But those, those, uh, you know, those incoming connections are not infinite, as it says there, but you know, there's lots of web servers, and the web servers have and this many threads and this many connections, but it could be many thousand, right? And, and PG Bouncer helps basically control that. And PG Bouncer itself can actually accept many thousands of, of client connections at once. And it will basically just make sure you get, you know, only 20 or so are passed through at a time and the other ones have to wait. And they only wait effectively briefly. Uh, so this doesn't actually hurt anyone. So the way, the way you set this up is you have a, in the uh, configuration file in the, uh, PG Bouncer section, you set the default pool size. The, the default setting is 20, but again, you should set that to something that you like. Another option that is in there, which I haven't actually used, but you can, you can set it so in this case, for example, that if a client has to wait, in this case, three or more seconds to get a slot, it will then open up this reserve pool of five more connections or whatever you said. I, I don't know how useful that could be, but th th those are the kinds of options that PG Bouncer provides. And now I say, well, okay, now if, if you don't have that many connections, uh, what do you do? You wait. Um, obviously, that can work briefly, but eventually if there's too much waiting, at least that's a signal for you, maybe you should provide more database resources or you know, split up your database server in a different way or optimize your queries or something like that. Uh, uh, PG Bouncer has a way to you can monitor that. PG Bouncer has a sort of an internal fake database. So the normal, for those who are not too familiar with PG Bouncer, just a brief explanation. Norm, the normal functionality of PG Bouncer is I connect to it, it just passes the connection through. But if you connect to it, the database called PG Bouncer, that's actually internal to the proxy where you can read statistics out and it has these you know, fake SQL-like commands, like show pools, for example, which gives you information about this uh, situation. So in this case, there's not a lot going on here, but if you had, so for example, here are the incoming uh, clients from the web tier, for example. Currently, there are none waiting. If this were fully, like if this had full traffic, this server's active would say something like 20 and then you might have a couple waiting here. And then down here it says how long the longest one has been waiting. And this is the sort of thing you want to throw your monitoring system on, right? Basically, whatever monitoring system you use, you write a check which can use whatever you know, normal Postgres client you have, connect to this address and run this query, and then this, this is a normal Postgres result set, so you can all use 
call your normal APIs to look at this data. And then, you know, when the client's waiting is, is too big, then you should, you know, at least record that or throw an alert. And then if that ha happens a lot, then you need to provide more processing power. So the uh, experience for the client might be it has to wait a while, but at least it won't error. At least the database server will stay up, right? As opposed to the alternative is that the client might get a result really slowly, but then all the clients are going to be super slow and the database server gets trashed. So that's not good. So that's what we want to avoid. And, and this is at least for a site like ours where you are ex basically exposed to the open internet. This is uh, super useful. Questions about this? So then let's talk about connection routing. Again, this is a term I made up. Um, how do you connect to Postgres? There was a presentation in another conference a couple years ago where a, you know, someone was presenting their use case of how they use Postgres and what issues they had. And the first issue they had was like, it's, well, how do you connect to Postgres? Well, obviously you do something like this, right? Whatever programming environment you have, you pull out the driver, put in some you know, host name and, and things like that, and then you connect it. Well, that's easy, right? But that's obviously not what you really do, right? Because you don't want to hard code host names in your code. Maybe you do, but OK. Many people don't want to do that. Uh, you then, OK, you think of some, OK, I should have a configuration file. But how do I distribute that configuration file? Maybe I should have a configuration server system. How do I get that distributed? And maybe you have something really fancy where you can really, how, do, how does that then work across different programming environments, right? If you have the first line there is supposed to be PHP, the second line is uh, supposed to be Python, you know, and you could have many more. How do you make sure all these environments get your connection and configuration inf information all the time? Well, maybe you have that figured out, but then surely you have like some random cron jobs running around somewhere with just a shell script, which is probably not going to connect to whatever super configuration system you have. So there's always some nonsense like that lying around, but someone is just hard coding configuration uh, information like that. So uh, how, do you, how do you address that? Well, let's look at this uh, diagram from earlier again. If you do this, then your client doesn't actually have to know where your database is. Because all it has to know is where this guy is. And that's pretty easy because it's on local host. And if you decide on the port number, then that's pretty much all you need to know. And then this guy, in its configuration file, knows where all the database servers are. And that solves that problem. So essentially, you write a configuration file for PG Bonzo like that. You, know, you have to name all your applications somehow. But that's pretty much all you need to do. And then you, need, you have one configuration file format which contains all the knowledge of where all the database servers are, what port. They might have a different port, a different user, or anything like that. You have this one file. You can distribute that across. You know, it's the same file you can distribute somehow across all your servers. But then all your, all your code needs to know is localhost, which is the default, so you don't even have to mention that. You need to have a port. okay? As I mentioned earlier, this is not what I'm necessarily recommending, but as I mentioned earlier, you could also run PG Balancer on 5432, and then you, you can even omit that, right? Maybe that's not such a good idea. It's too, too implicit, maybe. And that's it. And that, those, that's how our applications kind of look like, because we do that. So we don't have the, the application developers, or whoever comes up with these, uh, this code, doesn't have to know anything about what the database servers are. All they need to know is, on your local machine, there's a PG Balancer running on that port. You connect there and everything will be fine. And my job for the last year has been actually to like, just trace down all the code that violates that. And you know, a very difficult process to then identify, find the code, find out who's responsible, and who wrote that 10 years ago. And you know, it's very annoying. So this is much more helpful. Uh, um, PG Bouncer, 
I was going to talk about it later a little bit, but PG Bouncer is, is, does not have the fanciest access control mechanism. It has usernames and passwords. So you, you, can, have, yeah, you can have some access control. Uh, and yeah, that's basically it, right? You, you, how, how you distribute passwords is, you know, perhaps a, a separate question, but it's no, no different from what you would normally do, right? You can use a PG Pass file or, you know, LDAP lookup, or there's other ways to do it, but I, I don't have like a really sophisticated solution for that, but it's basically the same as what you would normally do, right? So now, th this previous example was just one host. In practice, it might look more a little bit like that, right? And in, 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 in practice, you have a lot more clients than those three, certainly. You know, we have hundreds. You have a lot more databases, but you have a lot more clients and databases, probably. And now, one thing that this allows you, if you need to move a database down there to somewhere else, this is you know, quite easy because there's only one place you have to change it. But it could be difficult to make that one change and propagate it to all those hundreds of clients at the same time. Especially if you want to do sort of a live failover or things like that, you really need to have everyone in sync, at least within sort of a, a very, very short uh, time frame. And that could be difficult just in terms of how long does it actually take to log into all these machines and make those changes depending on what system you use, or what if just one of those clients is currently down, then the whole process will fail, right? So if you have that situation, then uh, I rather propose a system like that, which is actually what we're using to have an, another layer of PG Bouncer which has all that knowledge. And, and that's then very simple to update, right? So we have basically these uh, locally running PG Bouncers which you know, provide connection pooling to the app and let, let the app easily connect to Postgres because it only has to know about this. And then this guy knows about this guy. And this guy knows about all the databases. And then whenever there's a change in one of the databases, or we have to add another one, or have to fail over, change hardware, anything like that, all we have to do is update this. And that can be done very quickly and, and sort of quasi-atomically. Well, it, it does introduce latency, but we accept that, basically, right? <laughs> Obviously, because you don't, there, I mean, there's other considera considerations to application design, right? There's obviously caching here and stuff too. So by the time you hit the database, you have already accepted that you are, have much more latency than if you read from cache or things like that. So, yes? Uh, why did the app not go directly to the same machine? Why do you have to change the machine? Because that also gets moved around. <laughs> you, yeah, if you really, I mean, this, this is sort of, if you don't like this, you can also do what you know, he proposed and just skip those. But then you expose these guys to your design down here and sometimes this changes, right? Obviously we don't only have one here because that would be a single point of failure. We have several here which are load balanced. And we, we currently use a hardware load balancer, but you know this changes from time to time. So we have basically made the choice. We insulate all this business up here from all this business down here. And well, you could also be cynical and say, well, this, you, you, you might have heard this, like the way an architecture comes out is sort of informed by how the teams are divided that worked on it, right? This, in a way, is re reflected here because sort of the, the organizational boundary is kind of here, right? So, which, you know, is, again, if you have only one team, maybe you don't want to do this, but there's, you know, the organizational situation the way it is is also a fact that we have to work with. And we, so th this affords us uh, insulation of these guys don't have to worry about it and these guys don't have to worry about it. It's just a sort of a robustness in all, in all, um, on all, on all levels, levels. Yes? We don't do that, but you could do that. So his, what he is referring to is PG Bouncer is, is, a, is a single process. It uses libevent 
to do its multi-flexing, uh, I guess. So it's a bit like Redis in a way that it only uses one CPU, really. It's a, well. So first, so the the proposal was you could run multiple PG balances in one machine. Yes, you could certainly do that. We have not found the need to do that because it's as it was said, it's fast enough. We have never had any problem with PG balancer not being fast enough, and we are you know we have literally tens of thousands of connections coming into the to the, the client side there, and it's not a problem. But you could certainly do that if you want. That's that's an option. We we basically only use we use we use multiple instances in this middle layer, but we have also chosen to put them on different hardware boxes for the obvious reason that we need to be resilient against hardware. So, you know, we, if we needed if we needed let's say we needed 20 PG bouncers, then I would say, okay, let's only buy five boxes and put four on each. But it doesn't turn out that it doesn't mean that we need 20. But that's that's an option too. That you could do. So that's kind of how uh, we approach it. I don't actually know how the load balancer works. Uh, and we are actually moving to a different load balancer just now, and I've never had a problem this way or the other. I could, if you're interested, I could get that information from all guys who do the load balancer. But as far as I know, there's, you don't have to do anything particularly special. So connection um, maintenance. This comes in to what I said, if you're here and you want to move some of these databases around down there. You can say, obviously, I don't need PG bonds at all. I can all use virtual IP addresses and all that kind of business. You, you could certainly do that. We have chosen not to do that because there's all kinds of complications with different networks that are involved. And, and it, it's also not protocol aware, right? You could say, OK, I can move the virtual IP address around. But then the, the protocol gets broken, so the, the, the client will get confused, or you will have to break the connection, and the client gets upset. What PG Bouncer can do, it can do this in a, in a Postgres protocol aware fashion. So you can, again, connect to this sort of fake internal uh, like administration database. And you can use a command like that. You can say, pause this application. And then what will happen is it will wait. PG Bouncer will wait for all the connections that are currently in, or all the, the uh, queries that are currently processing on that connection to finish, and it will not allow any new connections. What it, what it means by not allow any new, it will just let them hang. The, the client will not realize what is going on, except, of course, it will take a little while to, 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 to come back. But other than that, it doesn't even know what's going on and that you're doing any maintenance. So what you can then do when you're done, you say resume, and everything just keeps flowing. And if you put that together, you can do things like that. You can, you can restart your backend Postgres instance without the client even realizing. If you build a shell script like that, but maybe a little bit more error checking and things like that, but the principle is like this. So you, you, you pause. Pausing will wait for everything to finish. If you have a long running query, this will not make you happy, because pause will just wait. So A, don't have long running queries. B, put in, put in statement timeouts or things like that, or have a timeout logic in this. So you need to make this work for your case. Then you can do restarts, or you can do other things like move things around or anything like that. And then you run resume. And you know, often this can, depending on how long the restart and things like that takes, you, know, you can do this within a couple of seconds. And your clients just keep working. They don't notice that the connection was broken or anything like that. So that, that's really useful. There's other, other commands that, are, that you can do. For example, you can also just kill all connections to a database, which is a little bit more radical than pause. 
But if the pause somehow doesn't finish for you, you can say kill. Then, of course, the client will get upset. But at least you, you get rid of all those connections you don't want anymore. If somehow the client doesn't have proper behavior or timeout. So, so we, we have some databases that are called production. And then I like to run this command. And that always <laughs> scares me a little bit when I do it, but it doesn't actually do anything. So that's always kind of fun. <laughs> so and this is, this is the magic. So the previous couple of uh, snippets I showed, you could, those are for restarting a Postgres server online. You can also run PG, you can also restart PG Balancer itself online. And it does that if you provide this R option. So initially we started PG Balancer without this R option, but now let's say we want to do an online restart, we pass this R option. And then what it will do is it will, the new process will start up. It will connect to the old process because it knows where the old process is because it has the configuration there. So it will connect to the old process. It will tell the old process, give me all your sockets. It takes all the sockets. I didn't know that worked, but it does. So the one process asks the other process for its sockets. Then it starts to pro pro servicing these sockets and it kills the old process. And the, the clients don't notice that. So th that's, that's total magic, but it, it does work and it's really, really useful. So you can actually just, and, and this functionality is usually in some init script or something like that, right? You don't have to do that manually. You should check whether your init script does that. Some init scripts that were written a long time ago, if you do a you know, ETC in a deep PG balancer restart, they might just actually stop, sleep, start. That's not what you want. But a lot of the ones you know, distributed from uh, community RPMs and, th and, and Debian packages and things like that, if you do a restart, they will actually do this. So you can just go in and restart PG balancer. It, it will actually not interrupt your, your traffic, which is awesome. So those are the, you know, the, the facilities that PG Balancer provides us, right? The connection pooling, the queuing in terms of controlling or the traffic to the actual database server, the routing the connections and, and telling so that so not everyone has to know where all the database servers are essentially. And then these maintenance commands so you can start and stop and move things around without interrupting the online traffic too much. So what PG Balancer does not do so well or other things. So as we already discussed, um, main, uh, access control is not uh, very sophisticated. It has a password file. Uh, you, know, you can put usernames and passwords in there and then you, it does the normal password authentication. But it doesn't, do, have, it doesn't have anything like LDAP or Kerberos or anything like that. Right? So, uh, it doesn't have any SSL support, either incoming or outgoing. For incoming, I've heard people talk about using S-Tunnel. That I've seen work. I, I don't actually use it actively at the moment. But S-Tunnel has some kind of awareness of the Postgres protocol, so it can kind of make this work. In, in practice, the answer in, in, in places I've seen is to kind of firewall off your database, subnet as much as possible, and then only allow certain access points, and then tightly control so who can you know, read the password files and things like that from there. So that, that's usually the approach that you have to take if you want to use lots of uh, PG Bouncer. PG Pool is better like that. PG Pool has a more of a pghba.com approach. Managing uh, the pool sizes is tricky. In a way, you can think of all of this kind of as, a, as a, a pipes, lots of pipes, right, with lots of connections, and you, you want to control how big the pipes are and how many connections are coming through. And if you have multiple hops and things, you have big pipes and small pipes, and then when you do maintenance, basically what you're doing is you turn the water off, right, and things like that. So you kind of become a little bit of a plumber at all levels, and you have to make sure if you have you know, these, these somewhat complicated setups here, and, and different, you know, these might all also be different, of different sizes, and then 
these might be different. And so you need to just stay on top of how many connections you allow at each point so that your, you know, your network of pipes will make sense at the end. Otherwise, you know, pipes burst, I guess, or the water backs up or anything like that, right? So that's, those are problems. Um, PG Bouncer originally came out of Skype because um, Skype used to be a big Postgres supporter and they wrote all kinds of cool tools including PG Bouncer and PL Proxy and Londista and, thing, and, and things like that. Um, the, or, I don't know if they, I think they probably still use Postgres because they're obviously not just gonna change it from one day to the other but as is well known it's owned by Microsoft now. Most, if not all, of the original team has left Skype. And so there's no sort of full-time professional maintenance of PG Bounce anymore. I know that people are still working on it, but it's more of a spare time thing, the way I understand it. I tried to reach out to the, to the maintainers before this. I haven't heard an answer yet. But um, so, you know, it's still being worked on here and there, but it's a bit doubtful, the, the complete uh, roadmap. So, but it's open source, it's out there, you can fork it. But it's super complicated code, in my opinion. So, so if you need more features, then there's you know, PG Pool is, is well known. PG Pool is, you know, effectively has the same sort of, it has the same label, Postgres Connection Pool, but it has a totally different uh, purpose in terms of it has a lot more logic in it. It does things like it can parse queries and know, like, is it a read query, is it a write query? It can go there. It can do load balancing. It can do, like, health checks on back-end servers and things like that. So it's a lot bigger in terms of functionality. I like PG Balancer because it's, it's, it's lightweight and fast. So those are, that's a pretty obvious trade-off. And the fact, of course, that PG Pool crashed on my test case, so. But, uh, yeah, so especially you know for for like a dot com type website, all of this functionality is like indispensable really. And some of these drawbacks we can work around. In other cases, maybe that's not the case. So that's uh, what I had to say. So I wonder what he thinks about that. That's uh, <laughs> my wife always asks me when I go to these Postgres conferences like, are you going to talk about do our dog? It's like no. But now, 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 I've, now I've done it, so that's our dog. Uh, <laughs> do you have any questions about the dog? <laughs> any questions about uh, other topics? <laughs> what, uh, so, so in the case of the restart, so say I've actually removed the database from the configuration file, mm -hmm. the database I retired, there were still people connected to that database. What happens to them? Do they get killed? If you do a PG Bouncer restart? Yeah, exactly. If someone is still connected to the old PG Bouncer, yeah, it will take that over. Oh, no, what I meant was, let's say I've got a list of databases that, that you know, I'm using PG Bouncer for. Uh -huh. um, I removed one of those databases, but it's still connected to the database. Uh -huh. Okay, you, in, in this case, you don't actually, so I'll repeat that for the uh, microphone first of all. His question was, if you remove a, an entry from the PG Bouncer configuration for an old database you don't use anymore, and then do a restart, what happens to existing clients, right? So first, you, you, in that case, you wouldn't actually do a restart because you can do a reload. So it keeps the same process, it just changes the configuration. Um, what happens to existing clients in that case, I couldn't actually tell you that, because at that point, I would have usually already ensured that nobody is connecting anymore before I remove that. <laughs> so, but you could easily test that out. I, I couldn't guarantee one result or another. Uh, in terms of, uh, yeah, okay, does that kind of, you don't actually have to do a restart, but if you do a reload and there's still clients connected, I, I don't know what happens. It's kind of, the difference between restart and reload is kind of similar to restart and reload in the Postgres. 
for most configuration changes, you just do a reload. But there are certain things where you need to do a restart. Uh, most you know, obvious examples are you change the port number, or you want to just install a new version. No, the, the restart would do a. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's basically how like a package upgrade works, right? You just do a yum upgrade or whatever, and it will, you know, if the package is set up properly, which most of the recent ones I've seen are, it will just do a, you know, a restart as part of its upgrade procedure, and that will do this online uh, procedure. That works very well. Yeah. Would you do the reload for, if, for example, if you have a replicated database, you want to do a controlled switch over or failover? You know, you, you notice your server is dying, but you now want to fail over to your standby. So you would uh, set the, the PG bouncer on pause, which drains out all the client connections from the, from the mm -hmm. database server. They are now all on hold. Now you fail over, you reconfigure PG bouncer in the, uh, in the config file to point to the new master, yeah. and you resume. And that way, with a little hiccup, uh, that the client really doesn't notice more than maybe a few seconds uh, it can't begin a new transaction, you have failed over without any client seeing any error messages. Yeah, so you almost always do a reload for any of these changes of you know, connection parameters or even certain timeout settings. The only time you really do a restart in practice, I mean, if you, I said if you change the port number, but you don't really change the port number often, right? So mostly upgrades. Is it possible to pass the uh, configure the client application information through PG Bouncer just for tracking and right? Uh, that's a little bit of a tricky point. Um, well, there's a there's a patch in the uh, Git master which is not released. It's, it's version six one release candidate one or something like that, where the client information is passed through via the application name um, connection parameter. So in the backend server, you will actually see as the application name, this came through PG Bouncer with this connection with, from this client. But that's not released. I actually have to test whether that still works if you have multiple hops. But what you can also do is um, log into the PG Bouncer admin database, and it has a list of clients and servers that are currently connected and how you combine them. And then you can, you can trace it that way. That's a kind of a manual process. I actually published a blog yesterday on how you can do that. But um, that's, it's not easy, but the information is there. You kind of have to string it together yourself sometimes if you want to you know, have, have this kind of information up to date. But the problem with that is actually that the clients connect so quickly, and there's so many that actually sort of having a full view of that is, it would be actually very slow and, and, and unwieldy, I think. So, does that, it doesn't really help, but that's, what, yeah. Do you use um, session or statement slash transaction level um, for that, and following on from that, do you most, if you use statement and transactions, do you use mostly stored procedures to get around the fact that you can't compare statements through Bouncer, or? Okay, the question was, do we use, PG Bouncer has a pool mode parameter, which is, could be, it can be, what is it, statement, transaction, or session, which basically says, how long does it hold on to a server connection for a client? And those are three different granularities, right? If you say session, one client keeps the same server connection for the entirety of the session, and then for transaction, and so on. We use statement, statement pool mode for everything, um, the reason for that is we basically do everything through procedures, so we don't need any other setting, and other settings will also kind of interfere with all the sort of queuing and routing, and, and it just holds things open longer for, you know, for possibly no, for idle sessions and things like that, so, yeah, and then you can't do prepared statements and things like that, but through you know, doing everything through stored procedures, we kind of have this implicit preparation in, uh, in PLP GSQL, for example, so that kind of works around that. So, okay, the extra network management comes as well, is that what you're 
yeah. But you know, there's, you always have like the fact that you're using procedures and itself is overhead. So you know, we we pay a price for other facilities, right? So there was a question in the back. No. Okay. Um, thank you. If anyone wants to debug that PG pool bug, uh, let me know. Otherwise, thank you. Thank you.